Um, before we get into today's message, I need to repent. Um, a couple weeks ago in Brothers Meeting, uh, we had a very lively discussion. He wasn't even there, he's too little. Um, after the discussion, uh, I was praying and, and I, I really felt God prompting me to, to look up some scriptures. And um, one of the things that I was reading is that um, as believers, even when we differ with people, even when we differ with brothers and sisters, we're called to a very specific way of interaction. And that's gentleness and kindness. Um, these are two of the fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians. They're also two things that, that Paul speaks to Timothy when uh, in the pastoral letter of Timothy. And he says, when, when you come into conflict, you, you have to speak with gentleness and kindness. And, you know, the scripture says that, that our talk should be full of grace and seasoned with salt. I don't usually have a lot of problem with the salt. <laughs> but sometimes I, I forget about the grace. And so, um, first to the brothers that were there, not this last Thursday, but the one before, I want to repent because regardless of my position, regardless of my theology or my doctrine, if I don't convey it in the manner which Scripture directs, I'm missing the point. And it can't be more about being right on the issue without being right in the delivery. Uh, in our, our marriage class, uh, Dr. Egrich talks about being right, but being wrong at the top of your lungs. And, and we can completely miss conveying what we're trying to say if the delivery is bad. Now that's not to say there aren't some times where, where we need to uh, be firm and stiffened with resolve. Scripture says, is, Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. But uh, I wanted to confess before the church, um, <clears throat> I, was, I was wrong. So first as a believer, but second, because Scripture tells us uh, that those who teach are, are judged more strictly, and it says that if an elder or a leader in the church gets off, um, they're to be rebuked in front of the church so that the church would take warning. And so I want you to know uh, I humbled myself and, and talked to a couple of the men that I felt I may have offended um, and, and addressed the issue, but I wanted the church to know. You know, being a pastor doesn't make me perfect. Um, as a matter of fact, being a pastor often makes me realize just how, much, how imperfect I am. It also doesn't set me above anyone. Uh, it doesn't make me immune to, to, to criticism to criticism, to correction, to admonishment, to uh, exhortation. And so, you know, I, I spoke with a couple of people. I actually spoke with um, those that presented on one side that happened to agree with me and, and spoke to them about how we presented and how we displayed. And then I spoke to the others and, and asked them for their forgiveness because, you know, regardless of the point, if, if this thing, which is not a heaven issue. This is not a make it or break it issue. If that can come in and cause division, then we've missed the point. We've allowed the enemy victory. So I want to start by saying that uh, so you guys know where I'm at. Um, but I want to get back into the, the feasts. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Leviticus chapter 23. Oh, children are... I thought they were dismissed. Children? Are the children here? <laughs> well, the only two that stood up were Colin and Joe. The children are dismissed. What children there may be. So 
So we have been working through the feasts. Um, Leviticus chapter 23, going through, it's the presentation of the feasts. Um, depending which theory you subscribe to, um, some say that there are four spring feasts, others say there are three. Uh, they, they join together uh, Passover and uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread as being one feast. Others separate them and say they're two feasts. Uh, one just follows on the heels of the other. So we have four in the springtime. We have three in the fall. But before those, we have one that, that we're called to celebrate weekly, and that's the Sabbath. Um, we talked a little bit about the idea that each of these feasts is a, a prophetic illustration of the things that are coming. They're, they're kind of an outline of God's plan. Uh, the Sabbath rest, we, we celebrate the Sabbath rest, we're reminded to, we're commanded to celebrate the Sabbath because on the seventh day God rested. And we talked about that there. But, but the illustration with the Sabbath rest is that work came distorted because of sin. Okay? When we get to heaven, it's not going to be idleness. That would not be heaven for me. I don't like to be idle. I marvel sometimes because Christy can sit and veg and do nothing and be perfectly content. And it, I, it makes me itch. <laughs> and, and, you know, some of my children are like me and and to be idle I remember Christopher he would stay up really late and he would get up really early we're like why do you do this he says because I don't want to miss anything everybody else is asleep what are you gonna miss there's nothing happening but he, he's another one doesn't like to be idle likes to be busy likes to be going about doing things but there's there's a type of work that is restful because when God created Adam he didn't create him to plunk him down in the garden and, and have Eve feed him grapes. Okay? He put him in the garden that he would husband, that he would caretake God's creation. So there's going to be a work when we get to heaven that is going to be oh so satisfying for each and every one of us. And, and my work is probably going to look radically different from your work. And your work is going to look different from their work. But it's going to be so rich and so satisfying. This is the Sabbath rest where, where we are going. Okay? So the Sabbath is an illustration of what God's plan is going to bring about. Alright? So moving on, we're to the first feast, uh, the Passover. So if you look in your Bibles, I'm going to start in verse 1. And then I'm going to uh, read 1 and 2. Then I'm going to jump down. To verse 4. Okay? So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Now, the, this phrase, uh, these are my, uh, are the appointed feasts. That's, the, the word actually, feast in English doesn't really convey it well because we think of a feast and we think of Thanksgiving. Okay, and we think of a rich banquet with lots of food and, and family and fun and, and things like that. The, the, the phrase being used here, while the feast can contain that idea, but the phrase being used here is actually a specific set-aside time. A, a period that you are going to set aside unto God. And then within that time, God is going to direct you to do certain things. Okay, because some of these feasts have very little or, or nothing to do with eating. Okay, there, there's not going to be a banquet. Okay, but, but for our sake, you know, the appointed feasts, these appointed times, God has called and he's given to Israel. All right? So, um, you shall proclaim them as holy convocations. What's holy? Set apart. Set apart separate. What is a convocation? Holy. Holy. An assembly. A gathering. That's, that's us. That's us today. We are set apart by God and we are gathering. That makes us a holy convocation. Okay? But these are going to be special times. Set apart times. Okay? So jumping down to verse 4, he said, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord 
the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. Verse 5, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. But you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Now we're going to focus today, I'm, I'm actually going to separate Passover from the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Not because I have one feeling one way or the other about whether they're two or whether they're one, but just for the sake of time, to try and to focus in um, on, on Passover today, and then hopefully next week we'll get to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the first part of this, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. So the very next verse, verse 5, he says, this is the time. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, okay, is the Lord's Passover. Okay, so the, the Lord's Passover. Whose Passover is it? It's the Lord's. It's because God did something. Okay? Now, it's interesting because this whole Passover feast is all about remembering. God, throughout His Word, encourages His people, whether it be Israel, whether it be the church, He encourages us, He admonishes us to remember. we got such short memories. Okay. Are you, has anybody here seen? Um, oh, I just lost the name of it. The sure. not the Ten Commandments, the cartoon one, the animated one. Prince of Egypt. Prince of Egypt. Has anyone seen Prince of Egypt, the animated tale of Moses? And okay, put your hands up if you've seen it. Okay, those of you that do not have your hands up, watch it. Okay. Because it's, it's incredible the way they do it. I, first, I'm, I'm partial to musicals, so I like the music that's in it. But, but they, they really did a good job for a show that's being put on by, by Hollywood. They did a really good job of telling the story. But it used to make me so frustrated when I would watch this. Because coming out of the, the parting of the Red Sea, or the, the Sea of Reeds, Yam Suf, they, they come up. They've been delivered. The, the army is destroyed behind them. And they celebrate. And they're, hey, everything's great. Hey. What's for dinner? <laughs> hey, hey, Moses, I don't see any drive throughs <clears throat> there's, there's nothing here. What are we going to have to drink? There's no water. You've taken us out into the wilderness. You brought us out here to die. Oh, poor and that quickly they've forgotten the ten plagues the, the, their ejection from Egypt not only were they kicked out we don't want you as slaves anymore we don't want you here get out here take my stuff and go they were directed to go to their neighbors and say hey give me stuff and you read about some of the stuff that they got I mean we're talking like Gold, silver, jewelry, fancy clothes. That I mean, God used that to bless them that as the birth of a nation, they would be rich with abundant provision. But you can't eat or you shouldn't eat gold. Actually, I've seen these people, that, have you seen they put gold on things and you eat them now? That's just weird. That's just weird. Okay, but but God gave them an abundance to get started. But they get across the sea and they get out. They're going to the, the mountain of God, and, and guess what happens? They start complaining. They start whining. Why? Because they forgot. Okay, so this first feast is all about remembering, lest you forget. So we're going to back up a little bit here. Uh, we're going to flip back. Uh, I'm going to try and do this very quickly. Um, I would encourage you, if you have not been to one of our Seder dinners, I want to encourage you right now, make a point next spring to come to the Seder dinner. 
Uh, those that are returning, we ask those that return to wait to sign up so those that haven't been can sign up. Because one of the things that, that we don't really pick up on in 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church and he actually talks about the Passover meal. And in, in chapter 5, he talks about Jesus being our Passover and, and our sacrificial lamb, our Paschal lamb. And, and then he puts a little comment in there. He says, so let us celebrate the feast. And the Christian church doesn't celebrate, do we? Maybe we might do something for Good Friday, but, but we don't really celebrate the... the how is it pronounced in, in Hebrew? Pesach. Say it again? Are you talking about yes. Pesach? Pesach. Pesach. Okay. I'm not even going to try to pronounce most of the things that I'm going to tell you today. I'm just going to ask somebody out here that knows how it sounds. Okay. Um, we, we don't celebrate that. But, but see, it, God illustrated by delivering, Egypt, uh, delivering Israel out of Egypt, taking those that were slaves and making them a free nation. He illustrated his plan for all of mankind. Okay, because remember, Israel is a type. God chose Israel that through them he might bless the world, that he might redeem the world, that through them all that he had promised from, from Adam all the way down to and through Abraham and, and down, that these things might come to pass, and it came to pass through Israel. Okay? So um, I, I want to confess to you today, I come out of a background of replacement theology. You go, what? Well, probably if you haven't heard it, you've probably been under it to some degree as well. Replacement theology started up in the church way, way, way back. We're, we're talking probably second generation believers like those immediately after Paul. And, and they started saying that uh, the Jews were forsaken by God and all that God had promised them has been transferred and put on to the Christian church. Okay, I, I don't believe that. Uh, I don't believe that anymore. I wasn't sure that I believed it before, but I could see how people would come to that conclusion, except for the fact that Paul, divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, happened to write Romans 9, 10, and 11. And he tells us that for a time, God has put Israel to the side because of the hardness of their heart. Why? So that he could bless us and draw us in to what was promised to them and through them we might receive it. There will come a day, however, when the time of the Gentiles, that's us, is over and God returns to restore, to fulfill the promises to his people, Israel. Okay? So... One of the questions I, I need to address real quickly is why are we looking at the feast? Why are we spending so much time in the Old Testament? Okay, Look, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, are the foundation and the walls upon which the roof, the covering of the New Testament sits. I've never yet seen a good house that had no walls and no foundation. Okay, Having driven through places where tornadoes hit, I've seen roofs It'd be very uncomfortable to live in just the roof. Okay? So we look at these things because through them God speaks to us of things that are fulfilled in the New Testament and things that are yet to be fulfilled. Okay? So we are going to look at this beautiful illustration that God is laying out for His plan for all of humanity. Alright? So, getting back to the Passover, uh, we're going to flip over to Exodus um, chapter 12. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to hit everything in the Passover because we do that at the Seder dinner, but there are a couple things that I'm going to draw out of this, okay? First, um, let's read. Uh, I'm going to read just a, a short portion of this. Um, you guys hear that, right? <laughs> He's never spoken to me that way before, but, um, you know. Look <laughs> out. Okay, so verse 1, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Okay, we talked about this before. This is God is establishing a brand new calendar for this new people that he is creating. Um, you will see at, at, in the early part of, of the history of Israel, the month is called Abid. Uh, later on it's called um, Nisan. And, and so when you hear these two terms, it's, they're talking about the same month. It's just been rebranded. Okay? So 
This is the, the start of the new year. Verse 3, Tell all the congregation of Israel <clears throat> that on the tenth day of this month every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill the lambs at twilight. Okay, so let's stop right here for just a second because we need to draw out a couple of things. Okay, the first thing is the, the new year starts and on the tenth day of the new year, what do they do? <clears throat> Look back up to verse 3. I just read this. Uh, on the tenth day of the month, every man shall take a lamb. And it can be a, a sheep or a goat, it doesn't matter, a year old lamb without blemish. And, and you did this according to the size of your household. If you had a small household, and the lamb was too much for you, then you would join with the neighbor and you'd go in with them. And, and you would take a lamb together, okay? So on the 10th, that's lamb selection day, okay? And keeping in mind that the Jewish day starts at twilight, and, and so there's evening first, and then day after, okay? This is taken straight out of Genesis. It says that there was evening and then there was day, the sixth day or the third day or or whatever, okay? So on the 14th day, you select a lamb. Now what's really cool about this is when Jesus had the, the what we call the triumphal entry, that was lamb selection day. That's the day that the, the, the lambs are brought into Jerusalem and they select their lamb and, and they have to set it aside for a period of days from the 10th unto the, the 14th and, and they inspect it because it has to be without spot, without blemish. It has to meet a, a, a standard. Jesus came into Jerusalem on the 10th, on Lamb Selection Day, and he presented himself at the temple every day from there until Passover. And each day, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the Herodians, the common people, they would come to him and they would examine him. They would question him. They would, they would try and trip him. They would they'd try and trap him. And, and, and he answered. He showed himself to be without spot or blemish. He is following exactly what God laid out as the prototype of what was to come. He is fulfilling the prophecy that God is giving through Moses right here. Okay? See, this is important. This is why we need to know what happened here so we can understand what happened here. Okay? Because we look at a lot of this stuff and it just goes whoop, right over our head. Okay? And, and we call it the triumphant entry. Uh, Jesus wasn't going into triumph as, as we think of it. As a matter of fact, uh, Scripture tells us that he wept going into the city. And, and the word for wept is he wailed. But like in bereavement, okay? So uh, Jesus didn't really look at it the same way we do. All right, so uh, carrying on, verse 7, uh, so I'm sorry, verse 6, it says, um, on the 14th day of the month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Verse 7, then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts of the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it. With your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Okay? We look at it and we go, it's, it's the Jews' Passover. No, it's, it has been and always will be the Lord's. Okay? So, carrying on, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. 
the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are and when I see the blood I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you then uh, uh, when I strike the land of Egypt okay so now verse 14 he's given us the what he's given us the the the, the how but now he's given us the the why 14 this day shall be for you a memorial day and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever you shall keep it as a feast seven days you shall eat unleavened bread on the first day you shall remove leaven out of your house for if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day that person shall be cut off from Israel you think God's serious about this oh come on what's a, it's, it's just leaven it's just a little bit you know, what's the problem doesn't matter whether it makes sense to us okay see that's one of the things we got to get through our heads about scripture scripture does not have to make sense to us sometimes God does things for his own reasons his own purposes and it really has nothing to do with us but we do it anyway we do it out of faith because we trust that he knows what he's doing right okay we got to remember in this relationship we're the children we're, we're the small ones that are ignorant and, and have yet to learn what is right and what is wrong. That's why God sent his spirit, okay? So, um, verse 16, on the first day you shall hold a sacred assembly, a holy assembly, and on the seventh day uh, a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe the day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread okay so this is the, the the background of this now the passover is the feast most often mentioned throughout scripture uh, there are 50 times it is referred to in the old testament and there's 20 21 29 times in the new testament okay so Let's look a little bit at what Scripture requires for the Feast of Passover. Uh, because interestingly enough, it doesn't really require all that much. Um, so, the Feast is broken down into two components. From Scripture, keep in mind this is just Scripture. This is not the Passover ceremony. This is not the Seder. This is what God requires for this feast. One, the sacrifice of the lamb. The lamb is selected on what day? The tenth. The tenth of the first month, which is? Nisan. Nisan, or Abi. Okay? Today we call it Nisan. Okay? So, the lamb is selected on the tenth. It is tested to ensure that it is without spot or blemish. On the fourteenth day, the lamb was sacrificed for the Passover meal, okay? There's one condition besides it without spot or blemish. There's one condition to the premise of the preparation of the lamb. Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> Cannot break any bones, okay? It has to be without <clears throat> a bone broken. Now, I've never butchered meat. About the closest I come is cutting up my steak, okay? So, so I don't know how difficult this is, but, but um, Alan, how hard is it to process an animal without breaking a bone? Not that difficult. Not that difficult, but it's important. God, remember, God is setting up a foreshadow, a type of what is to come. Okay? And, and way back at this point in Israel's history, God already knows what's coming, and he says not a bone is to be broken. Okay. Now, what's, what's interesting about this is that the, the Passover sacrifice actually takes place twice. Okay, Because on the evening, 
you are sacrificing the animal which you will eat. Okay, now historically, um, this was done in three phases, three waves. Uh, the people of Israel would come in to the temple or the tabernacle. They would stand in a line, a third of them would stand in a line. The priests and the Levites would, would do the work and, and they'd pass the bowl up and the, the priest closest to the altar would sprinkle the blood and they'd pass the empty bowl back and, and then the second wave would come in and then the third wave would come in. Now see, all of this had to be done very quickly because there were some rules instituted as to when it could be done and when it couldn't. Okay, it had to start after twilight. Okay, the, the actual call for this was when uh, three stars could be seen. Okay, three stars. All right, that's not scriptural that I can find, but that's how the Jews determined it was actually time to proceed. Okay, so the lamb was, was sacrificed and then was given back. They, they would take what was necessary, they'd give the lamb back, and you take it home, and then you would begin at that point with the Passover celebration in your home. But the next day, what would be the morning of that same day, at 9 o'clock, when, when the sun came up, sunrise, they would actually do the sacrifice that was for the nation of Israel. Okay, this is, there's the, the personal sacrifice, here's your lamb, they, they drain it and they give it back to you, you take it home, you prepare it, eat it, but then one lamb was sacrificed for the nation of Israel at nine o'clock the next day. So there's two sacrifices that take place, the one for your lamb and then the one for your sins, okay? So why is this significant? This is important because Jesus celebrated the Passover on the Last Supper, but he was the lamb the next day, okay? He was the Paschal Lamb the next day. And we'll see a little bit about that. The other thing, uh, the other part that um, is laid out is there are three components for the actual Passover meal. One is lamb. Two, unleavened bread. Does anybody know what the third one is? Bitter herbs. Bitter herbs. Right, the bitter herbs. These are the three things that Scripture mandates are part of the feast. Now, what's both sad and of interest is since the temple is destroyed, they can no longer sacrifice the lamb. So lamb is not, usually not part of the, the Seder meal from then to now. Now, some very ultra-conservatives still insist on eating lamb at the meal. <clears throat> But others say, well, how can you eat a lamb that hasn't been properly sacrificed? So there's, there's a little bit of contention there. But this is, I mean, you're, you're talking about the lamb, the most important part of the meal, is no longer a part of the Jewish. Did you guys see a corollary here? Because Jesus is the Paschal Lamb and the Jews have rejected him. Therefore, they, they, he's not part of their feast, their celebration anymore. There's coming a day when that lamb will be restored to them, but it's going to be a day when they understand it's not the bad lamb, it's the, the Son of God. Okay? So, three components are required. The lamb, the unleavened bread, the bitter herbs. Okay? That's all that Scripture requires. That's, that's it. Okay? The Jews, however, remember we talked about setting boundaries and, and keeping ourselves safe and, and the boundaries got further and further. They, they've got this, this very elaborate ceremony. Now, I'm not saying the ceremony is wrong by any means. I do want to make some points, though. In, in this ceremony, which actually was not actually written out in, in its full context today until about the 8th or 9th century A.D. A.D., that's... that's pretty recent when you consider the history of Israel. Um, <clears throat> God still used them. He used them to show them what happened. Okay? Because the first part of the... Okay, now, I've heard it both ways. Haggadah and Haggadah. Um, I know you two say it different, so I'm not going to ask you guys. Um, but but it, it's the telling... Okay, this is the, the telling, the program for the Seder meal. And, and this thing started in the Maccabean period, about 150 B.C., give or take, and then it was finally written up in its modern form, its current form, 8th or 9th century A.D. Okay, but what's really interesting and really cool about this process is, is they've broken it down into a series of steps. Okay? Jesus at the Last Supper 
followed almost every single one of those steps. So we see Jesus, because he was a Jew, and because he was perfect, he violated no law, he broke nothing between him and God, he lived it perfectly, he followed the Seder program on the Last Supper. And we're going to get into this, and I want to talk about this a little bit, because if you haven't been to the Seder, you've got to come to see how beautifully God orchestrated and, and laid out in display for his people what he was doing and what he's done. And they don't get it. And if that's not the finger of God at work, I don't know what is. Because if you have the Spirit of God in you, you look at this and you go, oh my gosh, it's just like they're reading the story of Jesus. <laughs> and, and, and it's all laid out before them. How can they not see? For a time they're blind. And that's for our benefit. Okay? That's for our benefit. Alright? So that the, the ingathering of all the Gentiles might be done. So, so don't look with disdain on the Jews. Don't look with disdain on the Jews because God still has them as his people. They are set aside. They are marked as his. And he will fulfill what he has promised to them one day, hopefully soon. Okay, so... A couple of terms I want to talk about. Uh, you've heard me mention Seder. Does anybody know what Seder means? Order. It's, this is the order of the service. So when we're having the Seder dinner, we're doing an order. We're following an order. And, and the, the, the order that we're following is laid out in the Haggadah, which is the telling, the telling of the story. Okay, so there, there are a number of components that they um, use. If you look, I have it here somewhere. There it is. Uh, I put an insert in the bulletin on the front page. Uh, well, it's, I guess depending which way you're looking at it. The front page should be the Passover feast, the order of the Seder. Okay? Each of these things is done in a particular order and a particular way. We're not going to address all of these things because there's a couple of them that I want to get to so you understand how this is significant and how it played out in the New Testament. Okay? We have multiple listings in the New Testament referring back to the Passover. As a matter of fact, the Gospels record for us that Jesus uh, celebrated the Passover. The Passover came four times during his ministry. Okay? We're going to concern ourselves with the last one, what we call the Last Supper. Okay? So, if you... This is for your edification. You can look at this. You might want to refer back to this because I'm going to go through right now. On the back side, we see through the telling of the Gospels that Jesus actually went through the Seder service and did a number of these things. Okay? So, one, the preparation. As they were coming to Jerusalem, Jesus tells the disciples to go and find a place and to prepare for the the Passover. And remember, they go in and he says, you'll, you'll find a man and, and he's got some water and he's going to go and, and you go and, and, and he'll take you to the place and, and say that the master needs the room and, and it'll be ready. I don't know how good of a disciple I would have made. Because I'd have been like, really? You didn't make a reservation? I mean, do, do we have a number or, or a callback or something that we can do I, a name? You know, a dude with water. Okay, we're going to find a dude with water. Okay, but, but they go, and then, and then they prepare. Now, what's really interesting is we have all these paintings of Jesus with the 12 disciples uh, having the, the Passover meal. But, but, you know, there were probably a lot more people in the room because we know there were a number of women, uh, women that followed them and took care of their needs, right? So it, it's logical that the women would have come and helped to prepare the Seder meal. We also know that there were others that were with them because uh, when they were looking to replace Judas, it says, well, we, we have to find someone that was a, a part of us from the beginning. And so we know that there was a group that they had to draw from, and there were two from that group that met the qualifications. So we know there were probably more people in there than, than just uh, 13 of them. So looking through this, there are a couple things that they, they followed. Uh, the washing of the hands, the, the Kaddish, uh, I'm sorry, the Urkots. Um, Jesus actually took that a step further and he washed the disciples' feet, something that the, the, the lowest servant would do. And Jesus modeled for them 
what should be the leadership model for us today, the servant. Um, we see the, um, the carpus, the dipping of the parsley. Matthew 26 uh, says that, that who dips with me, because see, there's, there's two dippings. And, and if you're not paying attention, you'll miss this. Because there's the first dipping where Jesus says he will dip with me. This is the, the dipping of the bitter herbs. And then there's the second dipping where he says, it was the one with whom I will give the sop. This is, this is the second dipping. Okay, so we, we see the carpus. Um, at the second dipping, I don't even know how to say that. Genie, any mm -hmm. idea? Cork. Cork. Okay, we'll go with that. The making of the sandwiches. They take the, 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 the mortar and, and they take the bitter herb, the horseradish, and the matzah, and they make a sandwich. And, and Jesus would have taken this sandwich and presented it to Judas. Okay? See, that's the second dipping. He's laying out for all of the disciples there who's going to betray him. Short of saying, hey, it's this guy right here. Judas, J-U-D-A-S, Judas the betrayer. You know, that guy? Him. That's him. I mean, how, how much more? But I think their eyes are still blinded. Okay? Because what God has planned has to come to pass. Because knowing Peter, he'd have got up, walked over and locked off Judas' head and then gone back and sat down and finished the meal. Okay? So, so we see Jesus is following this pattern, um, going down a little bit further, um, the breaking of the middle moths. Now, I'm going to stop right here because I want Dennis to come up and show you this. This is something that uh, the, the Haggadah is, is drafted from six different sources. It's taken from Scripture, it's taken from the Mishnah, it's taken from the, the Jewish commentaries, from legend, uh, from prayers, and from uh, praise songs. And, and that's where the, all of these things are drawn from. But what's so incredible about this is the, the, the Afakoman and the Matzatash. And I'm going to let Dennis come up and actually show us what this is and see if you can pick up why this is so cool. Dennis, I'm going to turn it over to you. <clears throat> Got a few little visual aids. So I'm having to uh, mentally do a little scramble here because Glenn finally got back at me. He's always accusing me of bringing up things that he's got started in his message and all that. So uh, you covered a lot of mine this morning. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> so anyway, I've got a few things here to be used during the Passover. And so, with that, where's my Haggadah? Yeah, right. I forgot. Okay. More aids. <laughs> See how I pronounce it? Okay. Whether that's right or wrong. But it, it's, there's several ways. Yeah. So there's a Haggadah that they use. As he said, it's a telling. Uh, he's gone through and covered many of the things that, that this instructs us with. One of the sections in, in the Passover meal is they go over the four cups that they will be, be drank during the Passover Seder. And it's the cup of sanctification. The second one is the cup of redemption. Third, or the deliverance. The third is the cup of redemption. And the the last is called the cup of praise or the cup of completion. So those four are four of the cups that is done during the Passover. And everyone is warned, because back in those days, and probably still today, they use actual wine. And part of the tradition is when you drink the cup, you have to drink it to empty. So they don't want you to fill it up too much by the time you get to the fourth cup, why you might have a little trouble <laughs> even picking it up. <laughs> so anyway, so part of that. So then we go through with the different thing, aspects that he has lined out on his sheet there. And they come to a section of the thing that is such a mystery or we don't understand and that is 
the breaking of the matzah. And the way the process works at this point in the Passover, where they take three matzahs, and this is matzah, it's known as the spiritual food, it has no leaven, therefore it has no sin, just like, so it represents Christ. It has piercings, it has stripes, it is the perfect picture of who Christ is. So they take that and they load up what is called a matzotash. And it's a silk or pure white cloth, and it's divided into three different sections. And this is matzah. Um, matzah oat is plural. So they take three of them. And during the Passover, everybody gets to sit and watch the leader do this. And they're not sure why three. Uh, we, of course, as Christians, like to think of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the Jews have different varyings, depending on the, whoever rabbi you talk to. So then they take this, and they take out the middle matzah. They remove, remove it, and then they break it. Didn't do so well on the middle. And then they take the larger piece and they put it in what we call a burial cloth because we're Christians and we know what that represents. So then there we have the middle matzah. And again, the Jews can't explain why or what it's called. <coughs> and then they hide it. We call it burying it. And part of the process is, is uh, we have the young people in the crowd at the Passover. They hide their eyes. And then, then dad, head of the family, he will take it. And he will hide it someplace. So that gets hidden. Then we go through a couple of more steps. And then there's an interruption or intermission in the thing. And then while everybody is there, we get to take place and we have to have a meal. And eat lots of ball soup and all kinds of good stuff. So then after the meal, this, what's known as the afikoman, has to be found. So the kids get up and they go around and they search and search. And this can take a long time, so through the process of this, you can offer up helps that you're closer, or warmer, or colder, and all that type of thing. So then finally, one of the kids finds the thing. And we've got some children that have come to our church and been to the Seder long enough. Why, uh, they know what it's all about. So they're out busting heels to, <laughs> to, get, to get the great reward. So that's good. And, when we first started doing the, the Passover Seder, why we had probably nine or ten children uh, that got up and did their thing, and I think last year we had three. So, and that's all one family. So, uh, but we have some young ones coming, so that's okay. Only the portion, well, only the largest portion of the program. What does that signify? Well, we say it signifies Christ. Right, but only half of it. I mean, why not the It's the breaking thing? of the bread. Oh. Jesus is broken, and he was put into the, into the uh, tomb. So that's what that represents for us. That, and it's, it's, it's interesting, like Glenn said, here God gave the instructions to the Jews, and they can't see it. They just don't understand it. So anyway, the thing that's brought forth and it is found, and the kids get a great reward. And then they take, after that, they take a portion of the, of the process or the Passover Seder, and the head of the household who's doing the Seder, he would break pieces of this and pass it around to everybody at the table. 
So what did Jesus do? He says, this is my body. Take and eat. So we, we break this Passover, the matzah, and we all get to share that. So here we have God telling his people and instruct them how to take communion, but they don't get it. And then, of course, after they take and break the, the, the Afrikaman, then they share the third cup of the Passover, the cup of redemption, and that, of course, is, is the blood that we drink at, at the communion. And then the fourth cup, the cup of praise, is the one that Jesus says, I shall not share this cup till the coming. So that's part of the process that we get to enjoy when we have our Passover Seder. So with that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to pause here for this week. Uh, I want you to reflect on this. Okay, because we celebrate communion. We celebrate it on the first Sunday of the month. Jesus was very specific in the times during the Passover meal, the Seder, that he took that cup and that matzah. Okay? And we're going to take a look at, okay, what does all of this mean to us? Because this is a foreshadow of what Christ was going to face in the next day, and actually next few days, because what's going to happen is, is Jesus is going to go into the grave. By the way, my, my personal feeling is why Half of it is in the Afrikaman because I believe the body of Jesus died, but you can't kill the spirit, the soul, nor can you touch the God part. That, that's what I believe. I, that's what I take from that. Um, but we're going to see why this is valuable to us because it explains the entire process of God's plan for our salvation. Okay? So we're going to pause there for this week. Next week we'll wrap this up, maybe get a little bit into the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh,